If so, the man you are. If so, the man you are to pick up sticks, then why expect to have a house of bricks? Merchant of fag ends, if that's what you are, why should they give you a full-size cigar? If so, the man you are, commissionaire, stock still to stand for pittance, why, that's fair. If so, the man you are, I can't see why, whacked from your hobo holding, you need cry. Balata or gold, if so, the man you are, the optimist prospector spit on your star. Now, who would hand out a hoot if such a man we had fits of grief, I don't see how I can. If so, the man you'll be to set your cap at Crisius crooked daughters, you're a low chap. For you may marry gold or ships or rubber, only if you're a proper money grabber. If so, the man you'll be, I'm betting, boy, you're not that cold, well turned, steel hammered toy. If so, the man you wear, upon my lights, I'd not give you this spate of good advice. Since so, the man you are to turn your back. And upon the butt also, I think, in your knapsack. If so, the man you are, commissionaire, if so, the man, marchand de go there, if so, the man you are, oh, merda, though, if so, the man, to bang each taxi door, if so, the man, be middle the man's man, too, if so, the man you are, to all men, true, if so, you are the servant man, why then, if so, the man, a scarecrow among men, if such the man you are, these words we waste, if so, the man by nature's hand disgraced. If so, the man you'll be for the back seat. If so, the man out of the hand to eat. A fat fetch and carry fellow to salute. If so, the man that's just above the brute. If so, the man like the majority of men. If so, the man that's envious of the pen. If so, the man you are of the other cheek. If so, the man that's venomous and sleek. If so, the man that's every man. These words, if so, a man, we throw to the dicky birds. End of enemy interview. I knew you'd like the enemy. He's the person who made pen in plastic fashion a new verse on the Helden label and colossized lot, all with his pen put pen clubs on the spot. He knows to live comes first. No bee in his bonnet out buzzes any other that lands on it. His balance is astonishing when you consider he has never sold himself to the highest bidder, never has lived a week for twenty summers free of the drum fire of the camouflage gunners, never has eaten a meal that was undramatic without the next being highly problematic, never succumbed to panic, cut his blood, his watchword, facing ahead in untroubled mood. He has been his own bagman, critic, cop, designer, publisher, agent, charman, and shoe shiner. What he has just narrated of double dealing is nothing to what he could. Of professional stealing, of the betrayal of unpublished texts to ladies of Cordy Day, and other crimes. His fate is, of course, to be a quarry of rich pickings. He's the bullseye of brain pickers like the Dickens. Of unwelcome names, blue penciled in an article, caught in the act and minding not a particle. He suffers from a strange delusion, uh, that is, that our age is straighter than was granddaddy's, of uh, that discrimination against all writers suspected of having eyes in their heads. Good fighters, when driven in corners, are common, but here's a fellow who does not wait to be trapped, an aggressive fellow. I'm sure you'd like him, and that was why I brought him. And it was a piece of luck, it happened that I caught him. That was Wyndham Lewis reading, If So the Man You Are, and end of enemy interlude from One Way Song. Now, here is Marshall McLuhan recalling his experience in recording Lewis reading. Yes, in St. Louis, uh, Lewis came down to visit and to do some paintings, and I managed to persuade him to read uh, something from One Way Song for our uncle home recorded. Uh, and um, it was most interesting to observe Lewis upon hearing his own voice. He, he uh, simply roared with laughter. It, all the years uh, preceding it had never occurred to, to him, but he had essentially an English voice. <laughs> Anyone who reads Lewis, uh, doesn't tend to get a very strong English effect or English enunciation from his prose. And Lewis himself apparently had nourished the idea that he spoke with a rugged American accent. And uh, so he just went into fits of laughter when he heard this very English voice coming forth. And um, upon hearing the Harvard recording myself just now, 
I too was surprised at just how English he sounded because after years of talking with Lois, I had forgotten altogether that he had an English voice. He didn't uh, bear down on his English character at all. He was very fond of opera. And uh, he would occasionally uh, produce a trill or two in that direction. But I, I wasn't, uh, no, I'm not, uh, after all, I wasn't uh, in his presence uh, day and night, as it were. But um, I can uh, certainly recall his uh, breaking out into song occasionally, uh, but often to illustrate a point. He would uh, use some operatic area just to uh, theme in some discussion. I think Lewis thought of his work as having immediate relevance to decision-making at the highest levels of human affairs, and naturally felt somewhat frustrated that his kinds of perceptions could not be made avail available in decision-making at very high levels.